Today we get to wrap up our Driven by Eternity series. And, and let me just say this. If this has not affected your daily life, you have not been paying attention. Okay, like this has been absolutely life altering for me. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you've missed any of the weeks over this past month, you need to, I'm, I'm saying need, you need to go back and you need to really take time to focus in and, and dive in to take a look at this series because what God is speaking to us in this season is so timely and so necessary. So I, I think it's a privilege to get to wrap this up with us today. My, my first exposure to John Brevere as an adult was while I was in Bible college. I was in Evansville Master's Commission, uh, and, and I read, the, the first book of his that I read was, was not driven by eternity. The first book of John's I read was called Undercover, and I now notice in my daily life that that book has shifted how I choose to live. And uh, it, it really shifted who I am, changed so much in my life that I, I became kind of a student of uh, John's. I started reading all kinds of books that uh, he had put out. And so since then, I've read several books. I read this book, Driven by Eternity, while I was a student in Master's Commission. I read it again when he re-released the book and uh, get to, to dive into it today. So because uh, of, of my connection to John and, and his ministry, Messenger International, when Pastor Rob and our, our preaching team started talking about this book, I got super excited. I, I think that in my life, John has kind of been like a mentor from a distance, right? And so I just got super excited to be able to dive into this the past couple weeks Pastor Rob has been pushing you to download the Messenger X app. If you have not done that yet, you need to, okay? Uh, everything, all of the content from the years of John and Lisa's ministry is on that app for free, okay? That is a Cyber Monday brilliance right there, okay? It is free, everything they've done, uh, and it's on there. It's contents, video, and, and materials that you can get your hands on. And inside of the content for Driven by Eternity, there is a beautiful tale, uh, a story that John writ, wrote for the book Driven by Eternity that is called Aphabel. And I just want to take a moment to say that if you have not listened to Aphabel yet, you need to. You, you need to stop your life and you need to listen to this tale Aphabel. We spend plenty of time watching TV in our lives, so uh, consider this to be a movie without a screen. The story was so impactful that they took uh, the, the story and had it adapted to become an audio drama. They took it to uh, Hollywood and had it professionally recorded and all original musical score. Uh, our Master's Commission students, the, the first years, listened to this uh, audio drama during some of their discipleship time this month. And one of the girls told my wife that after listening to it, she didn't realize how much she actually longs to hear the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Listen, that's what we're here for, right? And, and if, we can, if we can take some time to spark something in us that would drive us to live that way, oh my goodness, Another one of our students told me uh, that when they finished, they realized as they were listening to these judgments, it was a healthy, convicting punch in the gut to check how I live my life. So I want to encourage you, if you, if you can't find it, uh, there's, some, there's some papers on the back with a QR code that can help you get to it. If you don't know what a QR code is, come and talk to me, okay? I will help you get there. Uh, bring your students, bring, if you have teenagers, bring them along for the listen. If you have, have uh, older elementary kids, bring them along for the listen. It is so good. So, all right, I'll move on. I'll move on. I am a millennial. Uh, that means that I get my news from a, a various source of podcasts, right? I don't really look at cable TV. That's not a thing in my house. And so we get our, we get our news from a, a variety of podcasters. About uh, two weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast in my car. He was going through uh, several different statistics on culture. And he said something that kind of stopped me in my tracks. He said this, the statistics on death are stunning. One in one die. It's pretty reality, right? 
One in one die, as I was driving, I was actually pulling out of my neighborhood. My head immediately went to the scripture, Hebrews 9, 27. And it says, just as it is appointed for one man to die once, after that comes judgment. See, I, I read, I told you I read Driven by Eternity when I was in Bible school. And I've reread it. I've listened, listened to Aphabel multiple times over the years. I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. I grew up in church. I've, I've given my life to this stuff. But I can honestly say that most of the time when we talk about eternity, we talk about where you're going to spend eternity. The question we ask is, where are you going to spend eternity? The question that we're asking today is different. Today I want to ask you the question, how will you spend eternity? Now, the question where is still important. I don't want to negate the question where. It's incredibly important. As a matter of fact, Jesus probably talks more about hell in his teachings than he does about heaven. He was extremely deeply concerned with your where. Where is important. He wants you to spend eternity with him. Scripture is clear. Matthew 25, 41. It says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not prepared for you. It was not created for you. And so Jesus spends time talking about where you're going to spend eternity. But Pastor Rob has used this quote every week thus far, and I'm going to use it again. What you do with the cross will determine where you spend eternity. But what you do on this earth will determine how you spend eternity. Eternity, And that's what we're going to begin to untangle this morning. Because as someone who spent all of my life in church, it is far too easy to consider salvation as fire insurance. It, it is far too easy to consider salvation as fire insurance. Like, I, I said the prayer. I gave my life to Jesus. He saved me from hell. He is my Savior. And that is true. That is true how it works, but I think far too often we leave out the part that one day you will stand before your Savior, and he will not just be your Savior, he will be judge. And when I stand before the judge in my courtroom of forever, I will not be judged by my sins See, as a believer, my sins have been eradicated. Jesus died on the cross. He took the punishment for my sins. Psalms 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So when I stand before Jesus, I'm not going to be judged based off my sins. Rather, I will be judged based off my actions here on this earth. My stewardship of how I lived with what he gave me. Now, this is important because if we're not careful, this can be pretty confusing. Um, and if I'm being honest, I took a lot of time really unpacking this concept. I had to take what I knew and, and what I understood and really work it out through Scripture and with the Holy Spirit because this can, can be kind of confusing. I want to take a look at uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This is a Scripture that we regularly quote when we're talking about salvation. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that you can't boast about it. It's the gift of God. So salvation is a free gift, and your actions contribute nothing to your salvation. You confess Jesus as Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Heaven. That's the way that works. That is salvation. You are marked with salvation. But this can be kind of concerning if we leave it right there. If we don't move on to the next verse. And to be honest, the next verse... I could have quoted it to you before this week, but I'm not sure I would have connected it to the first verse. I'm not sure I would have quoted them in context together in light of eternity. I want you to take a look at Ephesians 2.10. After it says it's not by works so that you don't get to boast, then it goes, he goes back and the writer says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So no, your salvation is not 
based off of your works, but God still prepared works for you to do while you are here. Obviously, our works are not the ticket to heaven, but suddenly our works are being called to account. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. This is the amplified version. I love how it reads. It says, Each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it. Because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. And if any person's work which he has built on this foundation, that, uh, that is, and any outcome of his effort remains and survives the test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up by the test, he will suffer the loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who barely escaped through fire." You see, on Judgment Day, my actions will be called to be tested by fire. And if I lived according to his call for my life, then my actions will be as gold being purified by the heat of the flame. And they will withstand the test. But if I live my life, my actions, my thoughts, my motives for my own personal gain... And my life and the fruit will be as wood placed on a fire, burned up into chaff. And listen, I'll still, I'll still receive heaven, but I will have lost my reward. I'll barely have escaped the flames. It's a test of stewardship, and it will indeed determine how we spend eternity, a judgment of what I did with what I was called to do. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. This is one of the most impacting quotes that I've, I've gotten from uh, John over the past month of studying this. It says this, you will not be judged in light of what you did. Rather, you will be judged by what you were called to do. I'm going to say it again. You will not be judged in light of what you did. Rather, you will be judged in light of what you were called to do. Church, this means that you cannot just give your life to Jesus and go on living your life for yourself. There are post-salvation requirements in order to receive the full reward that God wants. Get that? He wants to give you the full reward. But there are things that you need to do with your actions in order to walk that out. Let's take a look at it in Scripture. 2 John 2, 8 says, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but you may win a full reward. When John's saying you have the opportunity to win the full reward, be careful, that implies that there's also the opportunity to not win the full reward. You need to be on guard or you could win a partial reward or no reward at all. But I want to win the full reward. I want the big, big house with lots and lots of rooms that we've been singing about in kids' church. I want the big, big table for all of you to come over and eat lots and lots of food. But if that's what I want, then that means that I need to step into what is right here, right now in front of me on my remaining time here on this earth. I need to be busy, focused on what he called me to do. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. I don't want my life to be ineffective for the kingdom of God. I want to be thinking about the other world during my time here in this world. So what should we do? I'm so glad you asked. Church, we need to use our gifts. 
We need to use the gifts that God has given us to build his kingdom. Now, Romans 12, 6 through 8, it says, Having gifts that differ. Get that? Your gifts are different from my gifts. Talked about that last time I was standing on this platform. We all need each other. We need our gifts. It says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Church, your gifts that you have been given, they differ from everybody else's, but you are called to use them. You are called to use them. 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Each has received a gift... So use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Two things I want you to take from this first Peter scripture. The first one, it says each has received a gift. It doesn't say that Pastor Rob has received a gift. It doesn't say that Pastor Mike Cass received a gift. It says every single one of us have received a gift. Pastor Rob sent me a study uh, a couple weeks ago done by Barna in 2018 showing the, the awareness level of Christians and understanding the gifts and talents that God has given them. The, the study says that 61% of practicing uh, and non-practicing Christians, they claim they're Christians, they believe that God gave them gifts to use for his glory. Only 61% of people who would call them a Christian, would believe that God gave them a gift to use for his glory. That's not enough. That's not a, a large enough percentage. But then it says 40% of all Christians, 40% of all Christians say they are aware of the gifts that God has given them. So of that 61%, there's a large percentage of people that don't even know what their gifts are or how they can use them for the kingdom. Church, we need to be in the percentage of people that knows they are called by God, they have been given gifts. You have been given a gift to use for the kingdom of God. And each one of us has received a gift. But from that first Peter scripture, I told you I had two things I wanted you to note. One, you have received a gift. And two, you are called to steward your gift. I'm not called to steward your gift you are called to steward your gift. You and only you get to decide how to use what has been given to you. Use it wisely because your gift matters. What are these gifts, Nathan, they're, they're, uh, that we've been called to steward? They're spiritual gifts. They're personal charisma, your, your personality your talents, your personal abilities, maybe your physical abilities. These are gifts that you have been given to utilize to impact the kingdom. So in 2008, there was a man named Scooter Braun who discovered and signed a young artist with RBGM Records, gaining recognition with the release of his debut seven-track EP, My World, in 2009, the young Canadian's career really began to climb. And then on January 18th of 2010, the hit single Baby was released and Justin Bieber became a household name. You know it was God who gave Justin Bieber the voice that he sings with? The talent that he uses? It was God who gave him the creativity to write said hit single that was going to take the world by storm and make all the junior high girls go, ah! It was God who gave him the platform. But you know, Justin gets to decide what he does with it. Justin gets to choose what he does with it. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I've, I've got a three seasons room in the back of my house. And this summer, uh, we, we put a, I put a TV out there and it's, it's the best place to, to read your Bible in the morning or spend some time with Jesus. I take that TV and stream some worship music on YouTube. Oftentimes I'm listening to, to Maverick City. And so one day I was out there a few weeks back and 
Uh, I'm streaming on YouTube just some worship while I'm reading my Bible and praying. And, and the, the song Gyra came on. And I, I love the song Chandler Moore, Maverick City. It's a great song, but it sounded a little bit different. And so I looked up at the screen. And wouldn't you know that Chandler Moore and Justin Bieber are leading worship together. And I'm blown away. Like, I, I was like, Sophie, did you know that, Ju did you know this? She's like, yeah, didn't you? I'm like, no, I had no idea. I had no idea. So I did some digging because I, in the beginning of Justin's career, I followed him a little. He was a typical teenage pop star doing typical teenage pop star things. I jumped online, I started looking, apparently in a low moment of Justin's life, he, he met up with a pastor friend of his and spent some time with him. He gives his life to the Lord and he begins to shift what he's living his life for. Sure, he's in process, just like me. Sure, he doesn't have it all together, but you know what he did figure out? God gave me this voice. God gave me this platform, and I'm going to find a way to utilize it for the kingdom of God and building the kingdom. And you know what? Justin will receive a reward for stewarding the gift that he has been given. Check out 1 Corinthians 4.2. It says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. See, God has given us many gifts, but the requirement on us is that we be faithful with what we have been given. Jesus tells a, a parable in Matthew 25. We often refer to it as the parable of the talents. I'm not gonna, not gonna read through the whole story for you. I would love for you to uh, go write that down. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Go read that later today. It's an incredible story. These, these servants are, are given talents, gifts, and abilities. One of them is given five, one given two, and one given one. And they take those talents, and the first two go and multiply them. And they bring them back to their master to settle accounts. And they walk before the master. He says, well, you gave me five. I've turned it into ten. And this is what the master says to both of those first two servants. Because of his multiplication of the gifts that he was given, his master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master's happiness. They multiplied what they were given, and they were received with joy. They were called faithful because of what they did with their gifts. The final servant took what he was given and buried it out of fear and concern. He did nothing with it. And in Jesus' story, he lost his reward altogether. Listen, in this, in, in this uh, story, I don't believe that Jesus was simply talking about financial resources. I believe that he was talking about the many gifts and abilities that you are given. Fear can cause you to Waste your gifts. Fear can cause you to shove your gifts to the corner and not use them. But you are not called to live it safe. You are called to utilize what you have been given. God's first commandment to us was to be fruitful and multiply, and that doesn't mean just having babies. So if I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, it is my job to take what God has given me and multiply it to the world around me. Amen. I want to build his kingdom with what I have. So how do we multiply? You're asking great questions today. I'm going to tell you. How do we multiply? You know, as, as pastors, we often stand up here on this platform and uh, we point you to a specific four-week class that meets here at the church, and it is called? That's right. That's right. Growth Track, it's a four-week class. It repeats every month. The week one, which just so happens to be starting next week, uh, and you can jump right into week one. It meets, was it room 43? Meets in room 43, you can jump right into week one. Week one, uh, it focuses specifically on following Jesus, personally and publicly. It's important. Week two focuses on connecting to the church, but now let's start multiplying here. Week three is about discovering your purpose. 
Discovering your purpose, it's literally designed to help you unpack and uncover the gifts and abilities that God has put in your life. That he's called you to walk in before you were born. And if you want to multiply those gifts, guess what? You need to know what they are. You need to know what they are so that you can walk in them. Then week four, we help you find opportunities to serve, allowing you to impact the world around you. There's another multiplication. It's being faithful. I'm using what I've been given to touch the world around you. Listen, we don't tell you each week to go to growth track because we think you'll enjoy it. It'll be cute and the snacks are good. We tell you to go to growth track because we know there are people in this room There are people online watching every single week, and some of you just got here, and some of you have been here for years and years and years, and every single one of you have a gift inside of you that you need to begin to utilize for the kingdom of God to build his kingdom. And if you're not using that gift, then you're missing out on the opportunity We push you to go there because we know you're called. Because your calling matters. Because your calling matters to God and your calling matters in eternity. I know that because scripture tells me in Psalms 139, 16, you saw me before I was born. And every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And in that book that the Lord wrote about your life, he gave you a specific calling. And on that day of judgment, the books, the plural books of your life that God wrote about you before you were born will be opened and they will be read. And when the movie reel of my life runs before my courtroom of forever, I want to make sure that my actions will be judged by what I was called to do. I want to make sure that my actions line up to what I was called to do, to what he wrote in the book, not what I decided to do For myself, because I know that I was called to do something bigger with my life. Check this video out. Question What are you called to do? Ask that question because we won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occurred. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account of your stewardship on earth. Evangelist Anderson, I'm not an evangelist. I'm an accountant. I I, I, I had an accounting firm. I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I'm an an accountant. I I had an accounting firm. I I help churches. I help ministries with their their, their finances. Son, where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. And everything in regards to that man's calling was burnt up before the judgment seat of Christ. Accountant Jones, step forward and give an account of your stewardship. Uh, Accountant Jones? No, I, no, no. I pastored for 35 years. I, I, I had a, a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,321 souls. If you would have sought me, I I would have revealed this to you. And again, in regards to this man's calling, everything he's done in life would be burnt up before the judgment seat of Christ.
Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. I only raised three children. I, I never preached to, to the nations. I, I never even been on a, a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you the 1,579,541 souls those three children impact. Sought me and you heard my voice. You were obedient to my call. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did you will be judged according to what you were called to do. You know, I spent the last 14 years of my life during the summer, I take about a month and I go to what I call the happiest place on earth, Lake Placid. I go to Lake Placid and run our youth camps. I have the privilege of serving on a team that uh, puts on the camps that our students go to every summer. And every week, an evangelist that's there will come and begin to talk, take some time to, to talk about what are you called to do? We talk to these teenagers about the fact that God has a calling and a purpose for your life. And so often during that time frame, we'll, we'll give an altar call and students will come to the front saying, I feel like God is calling me to, to missions or God is calling me to ministry. And that's incredible. We need more students that are answering that call. But I, I realize every year when I stand there that the call to vocational ministry is the minority of people in the room. The majority of the people in the room are not called to stand in a pulpit. The majority of the people in the room are called to be the accountants. And they're called to be the police officers. And they're called to be in the workplace. And they're called to be the full-time parents. The majority of the people in the room. And does that make their calling any less? Absolutely not. Matthew 5.16 shows us that we are all called to be a light to the world. So though I recognize the majority of people are called to do something different, I also, as I was preparing for this, began to recognize that so often we begin to have this conversation with our students, with our teenagers. What are you called to do? They're in that season of life where things are shifting for them. It's the season to step into the next thing. But how often do we have it with established adults? Maybe it's just the fact that we assume that you're already doing what it is that God called you to do. But I make no such assumption today. I don't want you to find yourself as Accountant Jones who was called to be an evangelist or Evangelist Anderson who was called to be an accountant. So let me ask you right here, right now today, what are you called to do? What has God written in your book, about your life. Your calling might be defined by your job or your calling, your job might be a means to pay for the bills while you fulfill your calling elsewhere. You know, when I was in junior high, I was in a small group led by Brandon Hall and Josh Hawkins. And Brandon and Josh, they, they welcomed probably eight to 10 guys into their home on any given night. And 
Though we would regularly sneak off and short sheet their beds, and and though we were always looking to light the decorative candles that I now know weren't supposed to be lit that were all over their house, every single time we were supposed to have a small group, they welcomed me in. Brandon and Josh became a safe space for my life. When I got into high school, Brandon and Josh continued the small group and and, and we begin to talk about what it looked like to be a real man and to walk in purity when the culture is shoving everything else at you. They mentored us, but they were never my pastors. I had a pastoral staff team. I had a youth pastor. They were people who were called to be in my life and they fulfilled their calling. They had other jobs. They, they had families. They had to pay the bills but they were called. And someday when Brandon and Josh stand in the throne room on judgment day, they will receive a full credit reward for every single person that I have touched and impacted because of the impact that they made in my life. And had they walked away from that small group because it was just too much work, they would have missed out on that calling. What are you called to do? There are people in this room who are called to live a life of generosity. You know, as we were planning for our winter retreat, I called a few people that are here and said, I I need some people that are willing to underwrite this retreat. I, I I need $500 underwrites for this retreat to make it happen. And I had several people say, yeah, I can do it. You know, I still need one more $500 underwrite to to make this retreat happen. And you know what? What's in it for that person? Nothing. Except that you get to be a part of every single testimony that takes place on that weekend. And every single one of the hundred or so kids whose lives is shifted for eternity will be tributed to your reward because you were faithful in your gift of generosity. There are people in this room that are called to be prayer warriors. And I am consistently blessed by Wendy Broussard who works here on our custodial team because every single time she takes a dust mop to the, to the gym floor that we've just trashed at a youth event, I know that she paces that gym floor with that mop and she begins to pray in the spirit and she begins to further what God did that night in those students. And every single time she picks up a vacuum in the hallways, she prays over our kids here at First Assembly because it's what she's called to do. And she's walking in her calling. So what are you called to do? Is the Lord placed fostering kids on your heart? And it's just heavy and sitting there, but you can't quite say yes because your job requires too much time. So you can't quite dive in all the way to what you feel. You know what, maybe it's time that you start looking for another job that gives you the time and the freedom to go and take those kids in and begin to change their lives for eternity. What has God called you to do. Maybe you were a student at camp once and you felt God call you to missions. Maybe, maybe like David and Roxanne, you feel that call, but life just got crazy and you went to college and you met your spouse and you settled down and things are good, but there's still that calling tweaking in the back of your mind. What are you going to do with it? Maybe now is the time. Maybe now is the place. Because church, get this, you will not be judged in light of what you did. Rather, we will be judged by what we were called to do. So what are you called to do? I'm going to give you a quick lift at home challenge, then we're going to take a minute to pray. First of all, if you have not gotten this book yet, please read this book. Please read this book. You need to read the Bible first and foremost. Read this book take the scriptures that are in it back to the scripture and read them in full context and let it challenge your life. Listen to Aphabel if you haven't done that. But this week, here's what I want you to do. I want you to designate a time to spend with the Lord to begin to have a conversation about your calling. Have a conversation with the Lord about your calling and ask yourself, currently will I be happy with the outcome of his judgment of my stewardship? 
What a question. Am I fulfilling my ultimate purpose? Is there something that God is asking me to say yes to that I need to be available to? And if you haven't yet, go through Growth Track. Starts next week. Go through Growth Track. Begin to search out your calling. Dive into it. Church, would you close your eyes for me as we close this morning? If you're sitting in this room and you would say, Nathan, I love the conversation about what I'm called to do, but I need to first give my life to Jesus. This morning, I've got great news. It is simple. It is easy. And like we talked about earlier, your actions have nothing to do with your salvation. That's just the first step is the commitment to believe in Jesus. So if you're here and maybe you would say, I need to give my life to the Lord for the first time, or maybe I need to do it for the final time. I need to make it right. Right where you're at, sitting in your chairs with nobody looking around, this is between you and the Lord. Would you just raise your hand? I wanna say a prayer with you. If you raise your hand, we're gonna pray a very simple prayer. Give you a minute if your heart is pounding. Say, I need, I need to pray. Is there anybody in the room? Is there anybody at all? There's one. Anybody else? All right. Listen, if you raise your hand, I want you to know that it is as simple as asking Jesus into your, into your life, believing in your heart. Here's what I want you to do. We're all gonna pray this very simple prayer together. I want you to just mean it with everything that you have. And the scripture tells us that by doing so, you are inviting Jesus to live with you. So would you just repeat this very simple prayer after me? Church, let's pray this with the one. Father God, come into my life. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the punishment for my wrongdoing. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I believe in you and I give you my future. Help me to live it right. In your name I pray, amen. Amen, that is so exciting. Listen, so exciting, I'm thrilled about that. Now I wanna, before we move on, I, I wanna ask one more question of us. I wanna ask everybody in the room, what are you called to do? I don't care if you're five years old or 85 years old, what are you called to do? The topic of this has been so extremely heavy on my heart. Thanksgiving, I was having a conversation with my brother-in-law and, and Sam, he said to me, he said, Nathan, I think what it really comes down to is that those of us who are called, we need to say yes. And then we need to take action. That's exactly right. But let me add this, all of us are called. So it's time that all of us put the excuses aside and take the steps to say yes and become available because you will not be judged in light of what you did. What you did could be good, but you'll be judged in light of what you were called to do. I know that usually after a Sunday morning service, we're all busy, we're all running a million directions. We got kids to pick up. We got to get home and have uh, lunch and all of that stuff. But I'm going to ask that this morning, before you walk out these doors, you take a minute to ask the Lord, God, is there something you're calling me to do that I haven't acted on yet? God, is there something you're calling me to do that I need to jump into today? Maybe you've been feeling that shift in your spirit and you need to look at your spouse and say, hey, I don't know what this is, but we need to pray into it because something is changing. Something is shifting. And as it shifts, you begin to say yes and step into it. Church, if you're ready to hear about what God's calling you to do, maybe asking this question will just continue you forward on what you've been doing. Maybe it starts a whole new journey for you. But if you're ready, to receive that 
voice from the Lord, would you just take your hands and open them in a, in a position of receiving? I wanna pray over every single one of us in this room this morning. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have had to dig into your word. God, there's so much in your word about the future and there's so much in your word about being driven right now by what is to come. So I pray over each and every single heart and life right here in this room. Lord, I pray that you would drive us to use our gifts and abilities and the talents that you've given us. God, let us not be able to sit still without utilizing them. Let us steward our gifts well for the glory of your kingdom that is to come. And God, I pray that out of this calling from this moment right here, if there are 85 year olds that are beginning to shift what you're doing in their lives, God, I pray fruit that is to come. And God, for those of us who are younger that are looking at how we can utilize what you've given us to impact the world around us, shift our lives, God, that we may step into your kingdom, having stewarded well what you've given us on this earth and I thank you and I praise you for it. It is in your name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Church, thank you for being here today.